Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you for being here with us today. If you're in the room, thank you so much for being a part of the service here. If you're joining us online, thank you for joining us uh, online as well. We're so glad you're part of our services today. Let me just say one thing before I get into the message today. Next week, I know we've already announced it, next week we've got our 20th anniversary celebration. There are some things you don't want to miss. We've got some former staff members that are going to be here. Uh, We've got an old worship pastor that's going to be here and help lead. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've got some videos that we're going to show you that you will not want to miss. How many of you were here in the first year or two of our church? Raise your hand if you would. A any, any, few of you? A few of you, okay. Uh, most of you don't know that, uh, most of you don't know Fat Richie, all right? So um, I weigh 285 pounds, about a, almost 100 pounds more than what I weigh right now. And uh, we've got video proof of that that you will not want to miss. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we've got videos from uh, churches that helped support us when we got started, churches that we helped start, and uh, just people from all over the world. So you don't want to miss it. It's going to be a lot of fun, and uh, I know you'll have a great time being here next week. So those of you online, if you can, come in person next week. It is going to be fantastic. You're going to have a great time, I promise, and uh, I can't wait for it myself. It's going to be a great, great day. Well, today we're going to continue in our series out of Joshua, how God turns setbacks into comebacks. And today I want to talk to you about taking new ground. And what does that mean, taking new ground? We all need to take new ground spiritually. And taking new ground is about going to a new level. It's about getting better. Um, It's about going to a place that you've never been before. It's about growing stronger in your faith journey. And so we want to take new ground spiritually. And so today I want to give you a challenge to all the people of God here at Avalon Church. And this is a challenge that I believe God's Word shows us today, but one that I also want to give to you as well. God, listen to me. Listen, everybody listening? Raise your hand if you're listening. All right. God is not finished with you yet. Now that ought to be something you celebrate. God is not finished with you yet. Aren't you glad that God is a God of second chances? And that he's a God of third chances and fourth chances and, and thousandth chances. Thank God he's not finished with you yet. And you may not be all that you should be. None of us are. You may not be all that you should be yet. You will be one day. You may not be all that you should be yet, but thank God you're not what you used to be. Amen for that. And you're not yet what you will be one day. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to hear me today. Today could be the greatest day of your life. Because today may be the day that you get saved. Today could be the day that you give your life to Jesus Christ. God has a destiny for you, and I believe that. He has a destiny for every child of God. Some people do not get in on it. Some people aren't aware of it. Some people don't follow it. But God has a destiny for you. He has a plan for your life. And I know that sometimes this almost sounds like preacher talk, but it's true. God is not finished with you yet. God has a destiny for your life. God has a plan for you. God is a God of second chances. And just because you have failed in the past, do not let your past determine your future because God did not plan that for you. And God has a plan for your life. I believe God wants to raise up people to shine as a light in the darkness here at Avalon Church. There is no doubt darkness in our community. And I'm not just talking about a feeling. I'm not talking about anything politically for sure. But I'm talking about spiritual darkness. There are people that are within driving distance of this church that simply do not have hope. They don't have the hope of Jesus Christ. They live every day the same. They get up. They go about their routine. They go to a a meaningless, boring job. They drive home. 
They live the same thing out every night, and they get up and they do it all over again the next day, and every day of their life pushes them a little further to the edge, a little further into despair, a little further into hopelessness. Why? Because if they don't have Jesus Christ, there is no hope. But thank God, I believe God is going to raise up people and has raised up people to shine as light in the darkness. I believe that God is raising up people at this church that may not even know yet that God wants to use them. They may not even be aware yet that God has a plan for their life. I believe with all of my heart that it will be across the spectrum, and we've seen it in the past. And we're going to see it in the future. We're going to see God continue to do what only God can do. There will be politicians that will be raised up in this house that are not really concerned about corruption. They're not really concerned about a selfish agenda. They're not really concerned about politics, but they're concerned about bringing glory to God. Wouldn't that be refreshing to have some politicians like that? It would be. And I believe that God's going to raise people up like that because they're not in it for themselves, but they're in it to be a light and an agent for change. I believe that God will raise up athletes and musicians and entertainers that will use their platform for God rather than selfish gain. I believe with all of my heart that God will raise up influencers for His glory. And I'm not just talking about Instagram influencers. But I believe he wants to use young people like that as well. You see, there are a lot of people that are on social media for selfish gain. And I'm not here to bash social media. We all know the ills of social media, but many of the things on social media are wonderful. They're great. They allow us an opportunity to present the gospel of Christ. But I believe that God is going to raise up people that will influence others for his glory. God is going to raise up business owners and leaders. He already has, but he's continuing to do it. Raise up business owners and leaders that are going to help fund the kingdom of God. He's going to raise up employees that will be the best employees in their company. He's going to raise up employees that are going to be a light for Jesus Christ where they work, and they're going to point people to him. He's going to raise up husbands and wives that will influence others for his glory. He's going to raise up parents who will raise children that will impact the kingdom of God. He's going to raise children and teenagers that are going to influence their school this year for the kingdom of God. They're going to be used by God to point their friends to Jesus Christ. I believe that God is not finished with you yet. I believe that God has a plan for your life. He has something far greater for you than you can even imagine. You see, our problem is oftentimes when we start thinking about what God wants to do with our lives, we think way too small. We think maybe just personally in our own job or an early retirement or getting a new car. And and whereas there's nothing wrong with that, that is way, way too small for what God wants to do with your life. He wants you to make an impact for eternity. And I truly believe that he is not finished with our church. The last 20 years have simply been preparation for the next 20 years. And I believe that God is going to raise you up. And he is going to give you a voice. And he is going to make you a light in the community that will shine and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I've said, there are hundreds of thousands of people within driving distance of this church that need Jesus. And we're not going to be the only church that God uses. But thank God, I believe with all my heart, we're going to be one of the ones that he uses to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. I believe that he will use us to reach thousands for him, to be able to start churches around the world, to start Avalon Church campuses across Georgia. And I declare in the name of Jesus, he is not finished with us yet. He's not finished yet. So today, we're going to talk about taking new ground. We're going to talk about it in your own personal life, but the application could also be made to our church. And I believe that we are, over the next 20 years, going to see more people saved, more people healed, more people changed, more people delivered, and more people brought back to God than we have in the first 20 years. I believe He is not finished with you 
yet. Today I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm going to read a lot of Scripture. Now, I normally do read a lot of Scripture, but I'm going to read two entire chapters today. Now, don't worry, it's not going to be boring because this is an incredible story that we're going to read today. And uh, so maybe you'll watch on the screen or take your phone out and go to the Bible app. Or if you have a a Bible like I do right here, you can open your Bible to that uh, and you can follow along. Now, the story we're getting ready to read is that Israel has gotten ready. They're getting ready to possess the promised land. The Jordan River was flooded. You may not know the geography over there, but every year the Jordan River would overflow its banks. And particularly in that day, without the engineering that we have today, it was impassable. It was humanly impossible to pass over the Jordan River during this time. But God did a miracle, and we're going to see what that miracle is. Joshua chapter 3 and verse 1. And so just follow along, if you will, with me uh, as we read this incredible incredible story. Uh, Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived. That sounds a little bit like Locust Grove, doesn't it? All right, but they're not leaving Locust Grove. They're leaving Acacia Grove. And they arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing. Now, they're getting ready to cross over and the first city they're going to attack and conquer is the city of Jericho. We're going to talk about that next week. You don't want to miss it. Three days later, the Israelite officers went throughout the camp. So they've been camping for for three days. Giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. And since you have never traveled this way before, I want you to look at that. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. You've never traveled this way before before. God's getting ready to take some of you on a journey, and you've never traveled this way before. They had not. They had never seen happen what they were getting ready to see happen. He said, since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you, the priest he's talking about. Stay about a half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark, and make sure you don't come any closer. I'll explain to you why in a moment they had to do that. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves, For tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. So they started out and went ahead of the people. And the Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. And they will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. And give this commandment to the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the water and stop there. Now, I'm going to pause occasionally just to break this up a little bit. You got to step into the water if you're going to take a step of faith. You got to step into the water if you're going to cross over to the other side. And God is calling us to take these bold steps of faith. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today... You will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, Amorites, and the Jebusites ahead of you. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And the priests will carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. Now, we've never seen anything like that before. That's incredible stuff there. And so the people left their camp to cross the Jordan. And the priests who were carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. And it was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point then began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. And then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. And meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground 
uh, in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. And they waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. By the way, there's probably around two and a half million people that are crossing the Jordan River. Now think about that. Enough time for two and a half million people to cross the river. Then chapter 4, when all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan and carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. And he told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in the front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on your shoulder, 12 stones in all, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? And then you can tell them. They remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the ark of the Lord's covenant went across. And these stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the men did as Joshua had commanded them. And they took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River, one for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. And then they carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. And then Joshua also set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan. So they took stones out of the Jordan River and made an altar out of it. And then Joshua goes into the middle of the Jordan River and piles up 12 stones. When the water covers it, it still will be a memorial for what God did. Uh, He says, so Joshua set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place the Ark of the Covenant were standing And they are still there to this day. As of the writing of this, they were still there. And then the priests who were carrying the ark stood in the middle of the river until all the Lord's commands that Moses had given to Joshua were carried out. And meanwhile, the people hurried across the riverbed. And when everyone was safely on the other side, the priests crossed over with the ark of the Lord as the people watched. And the armed warriors from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh led the Israelites across the Jordan, just as Moses had directed. And these armed men, about 40,000 strong, were ready for battle. And the Lord was with them as they crossed over to the plains of Jericho. Now, let me just remind you, if you're not familiar with this, uh, about two and a half tribes stayed on the other side of the Jordan River. They did not want to go into that land. They wanted to stay there and uh, settle that part of the land. And so God said, that's fine. And um, they sent, however, about 40,000 warriors. So probably there were somewhere in the Israelite army, somewhere between 400,000 and 500,000 men of war that were ready to go to battle. That day, the Lord made Joshua a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. And for the rest of his life, they revered him as much as they had revered Moses. And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come up out of the riverbed. So Joshua gave the command. And as soon as the priests carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came up out of the riverbed and their feet were on high ground, the water of the Jordan returned and overflowed its banks as before. And the people crossed the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. And then they camped at Gilgal, just east of Jericho. And it was there at Gilgal that Joshua piled up the 12 stones taken from the Jordan River. And then Joshua said to the Israelites, in the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? And then you can tell them, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before their eyes And he kept it dry until you were all across, just as he did at the Red Sea when he dried it up until we had all crossed over. And he did this so all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful and so you might fear the Lord your God forever. Well, today, for just a few minutes, I want to tell you how to take new ground. The Israelites were going into a new land. 
They were going into the promised land. God had promised this land to them, and he had promised Abraham that they would become a mighty nation. God is fulfilling his promise here. And so they are literally taking new ground, going to a place they had never been before, going in a way they had never gone before, and God was getting ready to do a great work among his people. Let me just give you three thoughts right from these two chapters about how you and I are to take new ground when God gives us an opportunity to take new ground, to do something new, to go to another level, to do something better, to get better than what we were before. Number one, you need to consecrate yourself to God. Before they ever went across the Jordan River into the promised land, before they ever began to uh, possess this land that God had promised them, before they even crossed the river, they consecrated themselves to the Lord. Now, I want to show you the word uh, purify, uh, which is used in other translations. It means to consecrate, to sanctify, or to set apart, to prepare, or to dedicate yourself. So when we say consecrate yourself, we simply mean to dedicate yourself to the Lord. If you're going to go to a new level, if you're going to take new ground, no matter what it is, you must dedicate yourself to God. We're talking about spiritually here. If you're going to go to new levels, if you're going to take new ground, you got to dedicate yourself to the Lord. Doesn't mean you need to be perfect. Doesn't mean that you need to have no sin whatsoever throughout your entire life because we know that's not possible. We all sin uh, even after we're saved. Even though we're justified, God does not see our sin. We are completely declared righteous because of Jesus. We still sin. Anybody that tries to tell you they never sin is committing the sin of lying because we all sin. But it doesn't mean not to have any sin in your life. It means that you dedicate yourself to the Lord. You give yourself completely to Him. If you're going to take new ground, you've got to dedicate yourself to God. And when you do that, God says that He will do wonders or amazing things in your life. That's what He did to the Israelites. They dedicated themselves to the Lord, and God began to do wonders in their life. What would it be like if instead of living your own agenda, living your own purpose in life, forgetting God, forgetting to put His kingdom first in your life, what would happen if you were to dedicate yourself to God? What would happen if you would say, God, I can't quit my job and just read the Bible 24 hours a day. That wouldn't be your will for me. But you know what I can do? I can dedicate myself to you at this job. I can say that I'm going to live for you at my work. I can say I want Jesus to live through me so others can see you in me. What would happen if you would dedicate yourself to the Lord? What would happen in your children's schools if they were to dedicate themselves to God? What would happen in your neighborhood if you were to dedicate yourself to the Lord? Here's the point. When we begin to dedicate ourselves to the Lord, the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord look throughout the whole earth. It looks to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for someone that will dedicate themselves to Him. Did you know that God will use you more than you ever thought possible? He will do more in your life if you'll just ask Him, if you'll just dedicate yourself to God. Now, I know a lot of times as preachers, we talk and ways that sometimes are confusing and we say things and people say, oh, that sounds awesome. I have no clue what it means, but it sounds awesome. And so I don't want you to not understand what I'm saying. When I'm saying dedicate yourself to the Lord, we're simply talking about an act of faith that says, God, here I am. Here I am. I I saw this one time uh, when I was a kid in the church that I grew up in. The preacher was talking about giving everything you have to the Lord. And this one guy took it literally, and at the end of the service, 
he came forward to the front of the service, and they had the old-fashioned offering plates. You remember the old offering plates, that the, the big old gold-looking offering plates that they pass around uh, in churches? I'm not sure why they're made out of gold. They're not really gold, but they look like gold. Maybe it's to collect gold. I'm not sure. But this big old offering plate was sitting up front, and i never forget this guy literally stepped into the offering plate and began to stand. And I thought, man, that's weird. What in the world is that guy doing? And the pastor came up to him. He said, son, what are you doing? He said, well, you talked about giving yourself to the Lord, and I'm giving 100% of myself to God right now. You see, here's the thing. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him. And he says that is a reasonable thing to do. Now, do you realize that a living sacrifice is an oxymoron? Okay? It is a seeming contradiction. Because a sacrifice is, by definition, dead. Because it's being sacrificed. But God said he doesn't want you to be dead. He wants you to be a living sacrifice. And all that means is simply this, that I give myself to God. I give my day to God. I give my work to God. I give my resources to God. I give my children to God. I give my marriage to God. I I give my home to God. You see, God wants you to be so committed and so dedicated to him, not that you're a weirdo. Uh, We talked with some people in our small group about this, um, about that, you know, some people, you know, they're monks and nuns and so forth. And um, some people believe that, you know, if you're really going to serve God, you got to do that so you can kind of be quiet and just spend all your time praying and all your time reading the Bible. Did you know that is not God's will for your life? In fact, I know it's not because the Bible says in uh, the Gospels that we are uh, to present ourselves to God. We are to live out our life for Him. God doesn't want you to isolate yourself from everyone. That's not what it means to dedicate yourself to God. If you think that you need to pray 24 hours a day, well, um, no, that's not your job, okay? It'd be kind of hard to do anyway. But God has not called you to pray 24 hours a day. Has he called you to pray every day? Yeah, I believe so. You need to pray, but remember, prayer is simply talking to God. What God wants you to do is to present your body as a living sacrifice. Do you know what his will for you is? That when you go to work, that you're a living sacrifice at work. That when you come home in the evening, that you're a living sacrifice at home. It doesn't mean that you're a weirdo or that you uh, never watch a movie or that you never uh, have any fun. That's not what it means. It means that you dedicate yourself to him. And when we do this, he's going to take us to new levels that will help us take new ground. I I love what he said, and and I told you I'd come back to this. He said, you've never traveled this way before. You've never traveled this way before. You ever go to a place you've never been to before? You're not really familiar with it? You need somebody to help you get around, right? Or if you're like a lot of men, you refuse to ask directions, and you get lost. And then when your wife asks you, are we lost? You get mad at her, right? So, well, no, look, you need, when you've never gone this way before, it's a new experience. It's exciting. God wants to take you to a new level. He said, you've never been this way before. If you've never been that way before, then you got to do some things you've never done before. And what God is calling us to do is to dedicate ourselves, to consecrate ourselves to the Lord. Uh, we are to worship God completely. Um, the reason that they had to stay about a half mile behind the Ark of the Covenant was twofold. Number one, it was practical because there were probably two and a half million people. He said, stay about a half mile back so that everybody can see. That was a very practical thing. By the way, God is a very practical God, okay? He's not called you to be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. And I got to be honest with you, I don't trust people like that anyway. I really don't. If all you do is just talk spiritual and act so high and mighty all, and you never tell me a joke, 
or you never tell me about your favorite team, or, or you never tell me about a movie you've watched, I don't trust you. I, I'm sorry. Maybe that's the fault. That may, that's bad on me. I don't know. But I'm just simply saying that God has not called you to be fake. God's called you to be real. Now, once again, if you never talk about anything spiritual, that's a problem too, okay? But the fact is, God has not called you to be so earthly-minded that, or heavenly-minded that you're no earthly good. Because guess what? You're not in heaven yet, okay? Anybody driving McDonald's traffic? You ain't in heaven yet. You might be in hell, but uh, we're not sure. And, and the point is this. God's very practical, but then there was also something very spiritual about this. They had to keep distance between them and God. And the reason was that Jesus has not died on the cross yet. You remember that in the temple and in the tabernacle, there was a big veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And only once a year could the, priest, the high priest go in and they had to tie a rope to his ankle because he might be struck dead. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but any job that requires them to tie a rope to my ankle because I might get killed doing that job, I don't want to do that job. I'll say, let somebody else volunteer. Let one of the church staff volunteer for that, all right? So I'm not going to volunteer for that. Well, God for years had said, I'm holy. You're separate from me. You can't come in. But thank God when Jesus died on the cross and when he lifted up his voice and he said, it is finished. Everything that was necessary for our salvation was finished. And at that moment, God himself took his finger and he tore that that, uh, veil in that temple from top to bottom. And for years it had been like God had said, you are not welcome. You cannot come in. And now because of what Jesus did, he threw open the curtain and said, you are welcome. You can come in boldly. Come on in anytime you need to approach God. That's beautiful to me. And God wants you and me to understand that God is holy, but Jesus gives us access to the Father. Well, let me give you the last couple of thoughts here and we'll be done. You, number two, you need to take your next step by faith. They stepped into the water. Do you know that was a step of faith? And faith requires action. Until you and I are willing to take a risk in faith, we're never really going to go where God wants us to go. You're never really going to accomplish or experience what God wants you to experience. When I was um, several years ago, uh, one of the trips that I took to South Africa to see Bob Graham, uh, Bob and Joanna, friends of ours, and of course, friends of our church, that we help them with the AIDS orphans there in South Africa. We've been a major supporter. We bought help by the land. Uh, we built one of the buildings there. Uh, God's used us as a major supporter over the years. Well, one time while we were there, we went on a walking safari. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on safari before, but it's a lot of fun. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I've been on safari every time I've been over there, but only once I've been on a walking safari. Now, let me tell you about a walking safari. You are literally walking in the place that they tell you when you come to the park, you better not ever get out of your car. Because if a lion doesn't eat you, then a leopard will eat you. And if a leopard doesn't eat you, then an elephant will trample you. And if an elephant doesn't doesn't trample you, a rhino is going to gore you with his horn. And if a rhino doesn't gore you with his horn, a a hippopotamus is going to eat you because they're mean, 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 mean. Like a lot of Baptists I know, right? They're mean, 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 mean. And if a hippo doesn't get you uh, and you're walking along, a black mamba is going to get you or a boom slang or a night adder or about a a, a 20 foot long cobra or all these other snakes that are going to kill you. In other words, they say, don't walk in the park. But if you pay us $49.95, you can walk through the park with a guy. I'm like, what? So I paid $49.95. Like, what could go wrong with this? But you know what I did on that? Now, I'm not saying that I'm the bravest person in the world, but there were people, I don't know, about a dozen or so in our group, and most of them, surprisingly, were older than me. I'm like, well, you guys 
made a mistake because I'm younger and I'm faster and I'm stronger and therefore I'm going to stay right next to the guy with a gun. All right. So, and that's what I did. I stood night next to the guy with a gun with a gun. But you know what um, I did because I'd never walked that way before? I needed help. And if you're going to take new ground and you're going to go where God wants you to go and you're going to let God use you in a way that he wants to use you, you got to have a little help. you got to be willing to receive help. And you got to be willing to follow others. Take your next step by faith. They stepped into the water. They crossed the Jordan. Taking new ground requires taking risks and giving your fears to God and refusing to live a mediocre life. That's what God wants for your life. And then finally, here's the last thought. Bring somebody with you. Did you notice that they built a memorial? They took 12 stones out of the river. Uh, Joshua took 12 stones and made another altar in the river. But the reason that God did that, it was very clear. He said, one day, your kids are going to ask, what are these stones here for? He said, I want you to be able to bring them along with you. And when you and I are going to live the kind of life that God wants us to live, we're going to take new ground and we are going to have the impact that God wants us to have. We got to bring our kids along with us. We got to bring our family and our friends and our neighbors along with us. Take somebody with you. Refuse to live a life that makes no impact in the lives of others. But say, I, with God's help, am going to walk in a way that I've never walked before. I'm going to go somewhere I've never been before. And I'm going to bring somebody with me. And I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll make that a goal of yours, that you'll be able to live, leave a legacy for those who are not here yet. And every time you give, and every time you serve, and every time you invite someone, and every time you work in children's ministry or youth ministry, and every time you serve in a ministry here at this church, you know what you're doing? You're leaving a legacy. You're helping bring somebody along with you. And that is my prayer that all of us, more than ever before, will leave a legacy that will make an impact for the kingdom of God. I want to pray. And I want to pray for you. If today you have never received Christ as your Savior, I hope today will be the day that you do. All you need to do is call out to Him in faith. And you know, there is no prescribed prayer in the Bible. We talk about praying the sinner's prayer. Well, that's not actually in the Bible. There are lots of people that got saved that we have their story in the Bible, and it's all different ways. But you know what was true about every one of them? They responded in faith. They trusted God. Peter said, Lord, save me. And he did. The Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your house. So we believe, we call out on the name of the Lord. And today, if you'd like to do that, say something like this to God. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. And I'm declaring my trust in him by faith right now. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and he rose from the grave. And Heavenly Father, I'm calling out on your name, in the name of Jesus, that you'll save me right now. If you're in the room today, please take a moment and fill out the next step card and drop it in one of the drop boxes on the way out or give it to someone that has a lanyard around their neck before you leave today. If you prayed that prayer online, then click the button at the bottom that shows us that you prayed to receive Christ today. Maybe today you need to remind yourself that God isn't finished with you yet. You're not too far. It's not too late. You can turn around. You can repent. You know that repent is one of the mis most misunderstood words in the Bible? We a lot of times think it's a bad word, but it's one of the most beautiful words in the Bible. You know what it means? It means to agree with God. Start aligning yourself with God. If you're heading this way away from God, you make an about face and you turn and walk toward Him. Who doesn't want to walk toward God? Who doesn't want to know what God thinks? Who doesn't want to 
have success in their life. Of course you do. Repentance will turn your life around. It simply means to agree with God. And so today, I hope you will turn back to Him. Maybe today you need to take new ground. Maybe it's in your family, your business, your work as a parent. Maybe it's in your school. Whatever it is, my prayer for you today is that you will turn to God. You'll walk in a way that you've never walked before. You'll take new ground and that God will bless your life. I believe he will. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus today that you would help us to take new ground as individuals and as a church. Help us to follow you with all of our heart. God, I pray that you bless us now. Thank you for this church. Thank you for all you're doing in this place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray and ask all these things. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.